Okay, hello and welcome to this afternoon's webinar about engaging with vocabulary learning. This is Sophie from English Australia and I'm just going to briefly introduce today's speaker, Vanessa Beal. So Vanessa um, is currently working as an English language teacher at Macquarie University English Language Centre and she also works half of the year as a teacher, teacher trainer and course coordinator in Montreal so she's lucky she seems to have the best of both worlds. Um, Vanessa also writes for Oxford University Press and I believe that she will have two ESL textbooks published this March, one of them about vocabulary, is that correct Vanessa? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, th well, thank you for that. Um, they're both general textbooks, yep. but um, definitely vocabulary features very heavily in them. Okay. Um, and is it definitely a focus, a focus behind them? Mm, okay, wonderful. Well, thanks very much for coming today. I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining the webinar this afternoon. And I really hope everybody is seated comfortably with a cup of tea and able to listen in a little bit more leisurely pace than in a busy uh, conference room. It's a little strange sort of sitting in a quiet space and talking to myself into a computer, but um, I hope I'll find a good pace to be able to convey lots of information about vocabulary. So I'll start straight away through the slides. I click. There we go. So the first slide really is just to open up a few ideas about language and the importance of vocabulary. In the 1980s, um, Professor Paul Mira referred to vocabulary as the neglected area in uh, language acquisition studies and the idea that everything was always around grammar. And I think it's not quite so true now in that there are lots of texts that are focused around vocabulary. However, um, I think we can all understand that vocabulary is so key to language and that if we're trying to convey ideas, we really need to have the words to fill things out. And what I tend to think about is grammar as the skeleton and then we're adding our vocabulary so that we can really flesh out ideas. So we have a few quotes there just to get you thinking about it and one of the you know the key ones there is uh, vocabulary is a matter of word building as well as word using and one of the things I'm going to be talking about is that importance of depth and breadth of vocabulary and the ability to convey ideas and to tell stories. So the first thing I'd like you to think about, and you don't need to write anything at this point, um, but I will ask you later on to write in any questions for me, or in fact, if they come up at any point, write them into the questions section on um, the webinar panel. Um, this is how I often begin with a new topic. And I do actually tell the students about the importance of vocabulary learning and get them to think about these strategies, you know, how they can do it when, why it's important, where and what. So the first thing I'd like you to sort of warm up your brains with before I start talking about the theory is what do you know and what do you think about vocabulary learning? So I'll leave that one sort of in the background for you to think about and you can draw as many stars on the page as you want and doodle around it as I speak. And I'll move on straight away into the content of today's presentation. So, in terms of the organization, I will begin by introducing and reviewing a few of the sort of conceptual ideas about vocabulary acquisition. I'll then move on to describe and to present some vocabulary development activities that I do on a regular basis in different levels of classes. And this is all with the idea of promoting engagement. And by engagement, I'll come back to this as a definition later on. But I'm really talking about moving, shifting, I say shifting the blame, moving the responsibility to have an active learner rather than a passive learner and to really convey the importance of being involved in, this, in that. So that would be the, the main meat of the, um, the presentation. And then the last section will move into questions that you may have about the information that I've talked about in terms of vocabulary and language acquisition. And then as we get to the end, I will sort of try to sum up the key ideas, the key messages that you know, I'd like people to go away with. So if we begin by looking at the main ideas behind vocabulary acquisition. 
And the first thing we need to think about is how do we define words? Now, I when I did my master's, it was in applied linguistics and about vocabulary acquisition. And my initial in my initial my initial uh, interest wasn't so much in vocabulary, it was in the way that the learners approach things, motivation, aptitude. But I also realized I wanted something that I could measure. And my, my idea initially was that words are very easy to define. We can measure a word. We can see whether somebody knows a word or not. And the more I've done this and the more I've been involved in this, I realized that, that is a very difficult idea in that, you know, yes, learners are difficult to, um, to categorize and to measure, but so are words. So we have the idea of, um, of defining words. We can also look at the idea of a word as a receptive and productive knowledge of both the form, the meaning and the use. And clearly the receptive and the productive knowledge of a word is different. But this, for, it, for um, just to put it into its relevance, is really to contrast it with the idea of the morpheme as the smallest unit of meaning. We're looking at a word as a smallest element that can can be uttered in isolation with semantic pragmatic um, meaning. And when we're looking at vocabulary goals, one of the first things we need to think about is the number. So the number of words in a language, the number of words known by a native speaker, and the number of words needed by a learner, a second language learner, in order to function in their second language. And we come up with lots of different numbers when we start looking at this. So David Crystal refers to two million English words. After that, the English, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary refers to 171,000 words in use. It talks about a number of obsolete words and then der derivatives from those words. Nation refers to 100,000 word families. And by word families, we're looking at the way words are, the way um, words can be all related, if related into a family, um, in the way that we can have employ, we can have employment, we can have employer and employee. So this is the way that we will be looking at word families. And in terms of how many words speakers know, the general reference that we come across all the time in the literature is that native speakers native speakers meaning an average, I think it's a 20 year old is the measurement that they usually use. A 20 year old university student has 20,000 word, has access to 20,000 word families. And these are numbers that I do sort of throw around sometimes in the classes, you know, how many words do you think you'll need to know? And then we move on to learning words. Um, Paul Nation talks about the importance of learning words and how vocabulary acquisition is absolutely essential in that lexical errors create serious disruption to communication. And I think we can all relate to that at some point when we've been in a situation needing another language. And, you know, we don't take a grammar book when we go on holidays. We take a phrase book, we take a dictionary and we try to piece together random words. I mean, I can say I can say vegetarian in lots of different um, no, that's the only word I can say actually in lots of different languages. <laughs> and then I sort of try to piece it together with, with other, you know, with other words like I. Um, so really the importance of vocabulary within that. So the importance of knowing words and most second language learners, you know, they can relate to that straight away. And they have that feeling of the difficulty of, you know, how can I access enough words so that I can perform at university or I can perform perform in a college course without sounding like a five-year-old or without sounding like you know a, a you know, small child that's trying to trying to convey a very simple message so one of the th first things to think about is the number of words that learners need so i'll refer again to nation talks about the number of word families to understand texts like um, newspapers and journal articles being around eight thousand to nine thousand word families to need six to seven thousand word families to understand a typical movie so this is much more conversational and the other numbers that come that are presented when we look at vocabulary texts are coverage and the idea of the number of words that we need to have a minimum coverage so that at that point we can understand around those words and the one way to look at this is if you see a sort of a fill in the gap kind of exercise can you understand the message with those gaps imagining those gaps being you know what the students don't understand and this initially was always thrown around as 95 percent 
coverage would be enough and that this could be attained with three to five thousand words uh, of the most frequent words. This has recently been revised again and looking more towards 98% being essential to be able to function and to be able to respond to comprehension questions, to be able to summarize text. So we're looking at quite a vast amount of words to try and understand and to try and you know, then be able to use. So one of the things I always talk about is being able to engage in the process of learning words. We've probably all heard about Crashen and the idea that, you know, you just need a comprehensible input, reading, that's all you need. This will expand um, language skills. Yes, it will. But how much and how much reading do you need to do for that incidental acquisition of vocabulary? Most people now um, agree with the idea that reading is not enough, incidental uh, input is not enough, and the, the, the gain is not there. And the idea that learners need to be made aware of the importance of exercises relating to vocabulary. And Nation states that the two most important conditions supporting this learning is spaced repetition, so a repetition, and the quality of attention given to the lexical items. And attention here, we're talking about the focus on both the word form and contextual clues available so that we can understand meaning. In terms of how many times we need to come across a word, this is an important number to think about when we're looking at the way we plan courses, classes, and for students to you know, know what they need to do to understand vocabulary. The number that comes up most frequently is 10 encounters. Now, in a classroom, I would simply say to students, how often can you say the word? How often can you read the word? Can you look at the etymology? Can you look at the way, it's, um, the way it fits with other words related to it so that you can build in repetition straight away? And then of course, using exercises that build on that. So I'll come back to that when I talk about the exercises. The other thing that is key when we're looking at vocabulary is the quality of learning is increased by doing things, by being active, by recalling, analyzing, elaborating on, giving deliberate attention to the language items. So this is where I start to move into the idea of teaching through engagement. The idea that the more you do with uh, the learning process, the better your memory will be. And I think we all know that from trying to learn different things that you know, we perhaps can't connect to anything else in our, in our muddle of a brain. And the idea comes right from the 1970s or you know, possibly even before, but the idea of deeper semantic analysis leads to longer lasting memory traces. So the idea of wiring into the brain. And Nation states this need for systematic principled approaches to teaching and learning vocabulary with a wide variety of methods. And some of the key elements that come up when we're looking at this are elaboration, distinctiveness, and difficulty. So the difficulty, the distinctiveness, and the elaborateness of the, of the um, exercise. Noticing, how good is the quality of noticing? The planning of, me the, sorry, the quality of mental processing. So how much is going into the process of learning? The importance of planned lexical instruction rather than just randomly coming across words. And then, this was the section that I um, looked at for my master's thesis was the involvement load hypothesis and giving uh, an analysis in terms of the need, the search and the evaluation involved. So I'll just take a little aside onto that to talk about a little bit about the involvement load hypothesis. Now, this is a motivational cognitive construct with the idea that recall of an unfamiliar word is contingent on the involvement load of the task. And what they do, um, the hypothesis assigns a number, either zero or strong, depending on whether it is absent, moderate or strong, of the level of need for the word, or you know, whether it's an assigned task, the, nev the level of search involved, and the, ele the level of processes of, processes of evaluation that um, the exercise involves. There is an empirical support behind it, using marginal glosses, fill in the blanks, and writing. And the idea that came that comes through with most of the literature is that the highest involvement tasks, so we can see that as being the, the writing condition, involves deeper processing, which then leads to a better vocabulary retention. Now, my master's thesis looked at this, and one of the things we found that, yes, the writing condition did um, create better 
um, vocabulary retention. But the fill in the blanks was also very good. And that was more efficient for students. It was more efficient for teachers to go through and check as well. And there was more control involved in it. So when I talk about the exercises later on, I will come back to this on the idea of the processing and the retention. But most of all to retain from that is um, Holstein's quote here, it is important to design tasks which focus learners' attention to vocabulary learning and to make them aware of the importance of building their own efficient vocabulary learning strategies. Now, as I move into this, I'm going to sort of blend a couple of uh, theoretical ideas. The first being, um, and we're all very familiar with this, I'm sure, Bloom's taxonomy, when we're looking at um, cognitive tasks. Quite often I have students come into the classroom, first time I meet them and I'm asking them to paraphrase, uh, to uh, create something new, to write something. And I don't look at the things at the bottom of this, um, this pyramid here. We go straight in with the right, we're, lo we're looking at academic learning, academic skills, and we're looking at the, um, the higher level ones. One of the things that we're looking at in vocabulary though, is to tap into students' abilities on the lower level skills. I'm just gonna move on to, it's not clicked. It's not clicked through, let me just go to the next. Okay, so, as we look at this, in terms of thinking about the taxonomy when we're looking at vocabulary, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have understanding, remembering, applying. And at the top of the pyramid, we have analyze, evaluate, and create. And what we refer to these are sort of the lower order thinking skills and the higher order thinking skills. Vocabulary can be, de can be described as you know, discrete items to collocations, then connotations, explanation and argument. We also have that process from receptive vocabulary to productive, the concrete to the abstract. And in this way, we're looking at developing a breadth and a depth of vocabulary, which then taps into the other elements with students. Now, this is where we start thinking about they're not just words, they're students that are learning words. And our students need to be able to come into the classroom and to be doing the things at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, which is going to sustain the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, in that it is very difficult to ask a new student that's just arrived in the country to consider self-actualization, to consider creating, evaluating, analyzing, when they are still trying to think in terms of the basic levels of, you know, how am I going to survive in this country? How am I going to survive in this class? And these are things that I think we need to take into consideration when we're designing our tasks so that we can build tasks bottom up, feel, students can feel more secure, and then we can move into the higher order thinking skills. So when we're looking at the engaged learner, what we need to do is to focus on learning as, as a mindful process, the idea of building new mind maps and networks, and by doing that, creating confidence and a sense of process, a progress. Depth of cognitive involvement. So the more the students are doing, will give them a better retention. The more they're practicing it, the more they will feel secure and the more they will be able to remember it. In terms of critical thinking, we need to think in terms of we're asking students to do this, but we need to think new language, new education style quite frequently, and also a new identity in a new language. So in doing this, we need to think structure. How can we create a structured environment which will um, tap into the students' invo the, the, their involvement and the fact that we're looking at people, the cognitive and the effective involvement of, of language learning. So integrating the two, what I'm trying to look at are different exercises that first of all tap into the bottom of those two pyramids in terms of Maslow, biological, physical, safety needs, asking students to remember and to understand. Lots of the students that we have um, at the university here 
come from a background where they have performed extremely well by memorizing. We need to use that. This will make students perform well here with the memorizing. You know, here are words to memorize, use these, these will be useful for you. And then we can move further up the pyramid in terms of more complex tasks analyzing, applying. And at that point, yes, we're not fulfilling all the love needs, but we are fulfilling a sense of belonging in the classroom. And only after that, when the students are comfortable in those, can we then move on to the more um, complex, higher level skills, where we're asking students to create, to evaluate, to investigate, to critique, and to really work on those critical, um, the critical thinking that we're going to be needing at university. So with this in mind, we will then move on to the next uh, section where I'm going to be describing the activities. So, you know, try to think of it in terms of the structure of going from the, you know, the lower order skills to the higher order skills. Now, the first is really to bring an awareness and to get students to think about vocabulary, to bring an awareness to it. And in lots of classes, I will start with an awareness test to get students to look online at what their vocabulary level is. And lots of the students have done, you know, an endless amount of IELTS type tests and they're very familiar with that format. And it's quite reassuring because it looks familiar to things that they've done. I'm just going to click to the next slide, which will show one of the, this is one of the types of vocabulary awareness uh, tests so it's looking at the different levels and this is a matching kind of exercise so you need to choose the right word with each meaning writing the number of that word next to it and it works always in clusters the words are defined with words at a more frequent level so you know if we were looking at tests seeing whether students are aware of the words at the 3000 to 5000 level the definitions come at the 2000 level I'm just going to go back to the previous slide. So the first thing I would do is look at the awareness. So one of those is the vocabulary awareness, vocabulary levels test. There's also Lex Tutor, which I will come back to, which looks at word frequency and it looks at the lists of vocabulary at the different levels. The other thing, clearly, getting the students aware of the use of online dictionaries and the fact that it is so much easier to read and to um, to record the words so we can you know just copy and paste from dictionaries at the same time and you know i really encourage students to create their own dictionaries by you know creating the word families finding synonyms for words and it's a way of taking charge of the process the other thing for higher level students is to look at um, the academic word list and the utility of that by having the 2000 most frequent word families. So if students have mastered that, if they can then add on words from the academic word list, which is a list of five, I think it's 580 words. There is also a new, new academic word list, which has a more extensive list and it, you know, coming from a larger corpus, but I'll, I'll talk about that another time. But the idea that um, using these lists and doing exercises can really put them in charge of being active in the vocabulary learning process. The other um, activities that I do systematically with classes are word clouds. I'm going to show a couple of those. Using mind maps to generate words and to generate ideas around a topic and then using word games. So I'm sure lots of people are familiar with free rice. This is always a very popular one with students. I will say something like, you know, your homework today is to contribute 1000 grains of rice. And if you go to the website, you'll see that this works very well and it builds on vocabulary. I'm just going to move next to though show a couple of the word clouds that I would use okay so the word clouds gives a, a picture of the words so it comes from wordle.net and quite frequently I would use this as an icebreaker kind of um, intro act exercise where students simply list words related to them they're thinking about themselves in terms of who they are their personality, their experience, and they write them down into the list and this generates through wordle.net, it generates the, um, 
a word cloud. And I do this as an icebreaker where I'll say, you know, you, okay, don't write that you've got, you know, pink glasses and you always wear red, red shoes because then students will know you straight away. But use descriptive words and then we will, I will collect them all and then distribute them in the classroom and we'll start as, as a you know, conversation, you know, are you the person that... Um, went to school in the, in the States, that kind of thing. The other way that I use these is for students to look at the information, the text, and to do an analysis. So by copying and pasting uh, a text into wordle.net, they can see the most frequent words. And I think my next one does show that. Just, yeah, so this is actually the words from this presentation. I just <laughs> lifted them out, copied them into wordle.net. And these are lots of the words that come up. So clearly words, vocabulary, knowledge are the most frequent words. And this is a really interesting way for students to work to get a pictorial uh, view of the words that are the most frequent in their field of study. So if they're working on a topic altogether, they can copy and paste all of the activities or all of the articles that they have found into wordle.net and it will generate the word cloud for them. And this is a way for them to sort of interact with it. And of course, this builds repetition. The next one. So the other, this is very straightforward, Visu words to use as mind maps, to look at um, connecting words. The interesting thing with this as well is that it shows the type of word, it shows the way it functions, and it's just a change from doing the, you know, okay, take out a blank piece of paper and write the words and then generate words, in that it generates words, they can then use this as a starting point to say, okay, now what's you know another word for this? Do you understand the meaning of this word? And at this point, I would say, you know, use a um, use a bilingual dictionary as well. And it's a way of generating ideas, generating words related to a topic. So then we can go into it and we can maybe do the reading or we can do a writing exercise around that. So the next set of exercises are going beyond just awareness and looking at it and looking more at the form and the meaning of the word. And one of the main ones that I use with this is uh, crossword puzzles. So to bring an, bring an idea of, you know, making it, making it out a game, but a very controlled type, type of game. So the first way I would do so using puzzlemaker.com very straightforward the first week I would do this which, whichever topic the students are working on students work with a partner they make crosswords using the vocabulary lists and the class reading so they're looking at the readings it's all very controlled there's vocabulary lists with most of the readings that we use they make a crossword puzzle then they exchange that puzzle with another team the second week, I take a little bit more of a step in there. The students submit lists of vocabulary and, to de and definitions, and then the teacher makes the crossword for the class. And then we can make it into a little competition, who got it first, you know, you can give whatever prizes you want at that point. And then the last one is getting them to do that little bit more. And this would be the, the following week where students submit lists of vocabulary, definitions, along with sample sentences. And so if we go back to the um, involvement load hypothesis, this is the idea that they are doing a lot more with the, with the vocabulary, with the, lexic, with the lexicon, and hopefully you would retain it a lot more from doing that. Now, what I found is that you really do have to, you know, check for the grammar, check for the definition. So at that point, the teacher is making the crossword using fill in the blank sentences and meaning clues. So I would give the definition and then give an example sentence so they can see it in use. And then they would exchange them. And depending on the length of the course and how fast we've, how fast we've gone through that, we could, you know, start all over again. And they're generating the words. Move on. The next exercise. So the third exercise is building from all of this and creating higher level interactions, higher level um, thinking, thinking skills, reading and arguing. And this would be a very much a vocabulary focused project. Um, in teams, three to four I generally look at, uh, students brainstorm controversial topics and they search 
and search words. So for example, and I think the examples I've got here are mostly from vaccinations, you know, vaccinations, globalization. They search for online articles on the chosen topic. Now it's important they're looking at online articles so that they can use the vocabulary tools. Each student in the group selects a different article related to it. And you know, if they're doing this in class, and I generally start this kind of thing in class, I can look at it and if you know, you, we can quickly look at the article and say, no, 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 that's too long or it's too, uh, too difficult and get a sense of, you know, they're more being on the same level. They read, they highlight long, difficult words, and then they use tools to focus on vocabulary development. So they could be using the wordle.net. They can also be using Let's see if I can click to this. Yeah, okay. So this would be the type of exercise they're looking at, uh, type of article. And I would then say, okay, copy and paste this into Vocab Profiler. So that was one of the list on the awareness list. Vocab Profiler will give um, a profile of that article. So we can see that this article, which was from the Atlantic, I believe, yeah, from the Atlantic about vaccinations and the controversy about um, keeping, keeping children out of schools. We can see that 70% of the words in that article come from the first 1,000 most frequent word families, 5.27 from the next 2,000, 6.9 from the academic word list, and then 17% off list. So a lot of these are, um, are, are proper nouns. If we look to the next list, so this is from the same uh, thing from Vocab Profiler. Our next list gives us the words. So we can look at these and we can decide, okay, what am I going to do with them? Most of the students, I would say, okay, now we're going to focus on this, then we're going to focus on the academic word list. Look at the words. You know, when I'm working in Montreal, we're then looking at cognates. Some of these would be very straightforward in that they, they connect very easily to French and, you know, it's not really a difficult word. Working with the students in Sydney is a different story. And, you know, we may, we may be looking at these. And really, the students need to understand these before they can move on to the academic word list. And it's a way for the students to create a word list on that topic. So if the students then have their four they're four articles, if they're a group of four, they're going to generate these lists. There will be an overlap because they're around the same topic. And then they'll create a vocabulary list. So once they've looked at their articles, they're reading, they're taking notes, they're retelling to each other what their particular article or what their particular perspective was about. I often get students to write individual summaries of the article. They summarize, so they're putting it into their own words. They're having to find synonyms so they can paraphrase. And they're also retelling it, so they're, they're, they're talking about it as well. At the same time, they're then creating a lexicon to share with the other team members. This can then lead to presentations of their individual work. So it can be an assessed, uh, assessed exercise with a summary and a lexicon. It can be a discussion. And it can also lead to writing an essay, either individually or as a team, in which they are showing an understanding of the issue, they are applying the different words, evaluating, and then creating that essay or that presentation. So the kind, this kind of exercise really creates a lot of repetition. It creates, um, or it integrates within it, recycling. It also has this peer review, so working within teams to work on this and revising. We're moving from the lower order thinking skills to the higher order thinking skills. So synthesizing, creating, and then, you know, this is all building in more, more repetition and, you know, getting a better um, retention. So the key element around this, though, is an awareness into the process, building their confidence and building a sense that the, they are involved in it and they are making progress. Now, my next section, I, I, this is where, you know, if I'm presenting and I have real people in front of me, I would, you know, be looking for questions around this. And, you know, what do people do? Because lots of people are already doing lots about vocabulary. And often it's within comprehension exercises related to readings or, or to the listenings. But what I'm trying to sort of um, promote here is that we pull this out and we really put a focus on it and then you know separate it from the actual text and then how can we incorporate that how can we build on those skills so we'll come back now to 
our star from from about half an hour ago now um, in terms of the questions so what I would like now is for people to really think about you know what do you do with vocabulary how do you teach vocabulary when is it integrated why is it a focus and you know where to put it into courses or into classes so I think now would be a good moment if you want to write in any questions and Sophie if you could uh, let me know what's going on with that um, before I move into sort of a wrap up about the key messages we can look at a few ideas okay great so if people can just type their questions in <clears throat> Okay, or any comments as well? Sometimes it just takes a little while for the questions to filter through, Vanessa, so we'll just wait a minute. Oh, right, that's okay. Right, yep. okay. Hmm, okay. I'll start relaying the questions, but by all means, um, all right. keep keep typing your questions in as I'm talking. Um, so, Vanessa, the first question, the person has said, our direct entry course has zero vocab teaching. Is this common? And is there a good <laughs> argument I can use to introduce some? Yeah, I think my first set of slides would be my first argument I definitely it should be it, I mean it's so essential because they they can't function I think what often happens though is we think there's no vocabulary in the course however there is it's built into comprehension questions around the listening and around the um, around the reading texts what I would say there though is that it needs to be pulled out again and really look at you know put the text through something like vocab profile and see the frequency of the words, how frequent, you know, are we teaching students words that are completely infrequent that they're not going to use again and yeah, build that repetition in. And, you know, as we approach a new topic or a new listening or a new text to, to try to find ways to, you know, first of all, for the teacher to do it or the materials writer, but also to get the students to do it. And if we, you know, if we say, oh, there's no vocabulary in it, my first thing would be when when I start the topic, I would be right. Okay, we're going to pull out vocabulary so that we can create lists, so we can create uh, you know tables for the students, so that they can then use it and you know work into more productive skills. Hmm. Does that? Yep, that's great, Vanessa. Can you also just talk a little bit more directly into your microphone as well? We can hear you. Right. It's just yep. slightly faint. Yep. Um. Right, okay. Yep, that sounds great. Uh, someone else has commented that they're not sure of the concept of marginal gloss. Could you please explain? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, that was very fast. I was you know, rapidly going through it. Marginal gloss. Um, now, there's two ways that we can do it. We can either just highlight. This a bit, one of the ideas is that we put the word in bold and then give a definition. You know, words in bold are then defined in the margin or at the end of the text one of the problems around that though is that students ignore it they, they may read it once but they won't read it again they'll kind of go yeah yeah I know that I don't need to read that um, another way around to bring a bit more attention to it is to give a multiple choice marginal gloss where we take the difficult words or the words that we're targeting and put them in the margin along with you know, three options. What does this word mean in this context? So that brings a little bit more mm. attention into it. And you know, that, that's one way to sort of, not to have a full on uh, vocabulary exercise, but it's something that can be alongside the reading and they're filling it out and they're getting the correct definitions at that same time. Mm. I think that, that was a bit clearer. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. Um, someone's asked, what do you think of online vocabulary games such as CRAM? Are they useful? 
I think they're really good. Anything. I think anything. And I mean, lots of people use, um, you know, cahoots and things to create uh, vocabulary, you know, so you can create them yourselves. But I, I mean, I get students to do the word of the day, get that pulled into their phone and things. And, you know, every now and then you get a really good class where they share the word of the day. And I, I look at them and I think I have no idea what that is. And, and but I think that's really good to get them aware of the um, infrequent words as well. I mean, I have in a advanced class shown um i don't know if people would know that there's a there's a friends episode where joey has to write a reference letter and he wants it to sound really fancy so he uses the the, the, the thesaurus uh, <laughs> and uses all the synonyms and of course it doesn't make sense and you know i show them that and the, you know the good students they catch on to it straight away and, I, and it's there it's making them aware of there are different different levels of the vocabulary there are those frequent words that we use all of the time but there are other words that you know we come across we don't really know them and you know and native speakers I mean they, they love it when they do word of the day and they give me a word and I haven't a clue what it is or you know I pronounce it completely wrong and and you know then we listen to it and it, I think it's a, it's a good way to open up conversation so all of those games I just think you know anything it, it open it opens up and you know language it's about communicating ideas and if that's one way that they like and it engages them, then that works. Okay, great. Um, someone has asked, do you have any suggestions on how to stop students from being overwhelmed by the sheer volume of new words when they move from a general English class to an academic English class? Yeah, I struggle with this because that question really annoys me when they say, you know, oh, is that academic enough? And you haven't a clue what they want to say because they've found some really... Um, obscure word and you know, my argument really is there is keep it quite simple keep it simple and then gradually move on to integrating the you know showing options for another way to say this you know, particularly in moving from sort of you know the two-part verbs to then finding a more formal verb to uh, to use that I, I don't think there's an easy solution because it you know when we ask when we're asking students in the academic courses to paraphrase um, and they don't have a strong vocabulary. I mean, I, I can't imagine doing that in a language where you've only got 2000 words uh, at easy access. Mm. So, I, you know, I, I think there's definitely room to create um, exercises there and you know, to just find different ways. And, and to, to make the students aware that they need to find tools so that it's ongoing it's an on you know they're not going to finish learning at the end of our classes they're going to go on to university where you know they're not going to know everything they're going to have to keep building this hmm. okay great um someone's just written an example of how they um practice vocabulary so they've said that we often do mood boards with words and pictures and then we keep these up on the walls most days we move around the room and discuss the mood boards, the past and the present ones, um, and we pretend we're in an art gallery or we can relate these um, words on the boards to new words from that particular day. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's really good because it's, it's just easy access and it's there and it's showing it as a process of learning things. And, um, you know, I, I think that's really good. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, same person's also said, talking of games, we love Quizlet. Oh, yes, yes. And I just think uh, different teachers have different resources and things that they're good at doing. And I think we need to build that into the, you know, to make the class our own. And, you know, some people like to do the, you know, the um, grass skirt kind of things for the vocabulary, where the, you know, the students are coming up at the front and they're grabbing it and they're trying to define it you know people find different ways to work on and I, I think my main point is really do work on the vocabulary don't get stuck onto the sentence level things because the vocabulary fills the sentence hmm. okay um, someone said just an idea Vanessa perhaps students could keep a vocabulary e-portfolio including their word clouds etc yeah I think that's good. I think it's good. Now, I, ha I think we have to be careful with that um, in the copy and pasting kind of thing. I have done activities like that. I actually, I was teaching aircraft, I was teaching English for aircraft maintenance at one point, And I had this brilliant idea that I was going to do um, a lexicon and that the students, and I didn't know any of the words. So as soon as we start looking at specific words, I think we have to be very careful because, you know, how good is our knowledge about aircraft maintenance? How good is our knowledge about um, words to do with 
finance because we need to be able to check those things but I mean definitely get students involved and take charge of it. Hmm. Okay are there any other questions? Any other questions? Shall I just move on to the wrap up of things yeah. and then if there are yeah. other questions we can yeah. keep the typing end. them in if you um, yeah. think of anything else. Right, I will move on to the next. Let's just click again. I don't have control of the keyboard, I don't think. Can you hear me, Sophie? I can't yep. go, it won't okay. click through. I'll do it for you. There we go. Okay, I think I've gone too far now. No, there we go. Next one. Okay, so just to, I mean, this is really moving towards the end now. As we um, <laughs> think about vocabulary, I think we need to think in terms of, you know, the expansion. So, you know, your vocabulary is enlarged. We need to think in terms of breadth of vocabulary, but we also need to think, to so the next slide, in terms of depth. Uh, you know, nobody ever asks, how is Waldo? So this idea of we're looking at depth of knowledge and as soon as students know of the word, do they know the different meanings of the word? Do they know the usage of the word? And, you know, of course, when we start looking at the academic, um, the academic word list, this is where it really plays in, you know, which is the most frequent use. So I'll just move on to the next one. So key messages to retain from all, the, from all of this. Extensive and intensive reading but incorporating into that planned explicit instruction a need search and evaluation as we look into it. I'm just going to move on to my next. Um, engage the students in their communication journey. This idea, the process of navigating a new world, a new language and a new identity for most of them. And one way around this to try to get over that feeling of being overwhelmed by everything that they've got to do is study groups and I try with each class that I teach to create study groups or you know put them into groups of three say right these are your study buddies for the the chunk of time that you're with me um, and that they are then responsible to meet to go through the work to do the extra little vocabulary projects to um, to work together and by doing this it's building security, sharing their experiences, promoting belonging, being able to negotiate if you've got multi-language multi um, groups, creating, um, creating language, taking risks and trying to express themselves in a smaller setting than in the classroom. And you know, this is then leading to you know, the fulfillment of the higher level, um, the higher level academic goals where you know, evaluate, create. But most of all, thinking in terms of the cognitive and the effective engagement, um, that the students are involved in the process and not just in terms of their learning, but in terms of it emotionally as well, you know, creating their world here. So I think that's pretty much it for that slide, if we can move to the next. Just on that slide, um, someone's asked if you could clarify the search part of the need search evaluation. Oh. Yeah, when we're talking about um, the involvement load hypothesis, search is whether it is teacher generated. Well, it's what do they have to do with it? Why, why are they looking for the word? Why are they looking for the meaning? Um, what do they have to do? Is it all given for them? So, for example, when I gave the example of the margin gloss, there is zero search involved if we've highlighted the word then we've written the word at the bottom with the definition there is a moderate amount of search if we've given um, a choice of definitions and which is the appropriate definition and then there is a lot of search involved if we're saying right okay look up this word in a dictionary and of course yes it would be great you know everything has to be lots of search involved but then we have to think in terms of the time it takes and how accurate they're going to be in finding that um in finding the definition so that's really the search component okay sure are there any other questions i'm just going to move if we could are there any other questions? Uh, there was one, uh, someone had just asked about um, your thoughts on teaching word etymology. Oh, I think it's, if you're interested in that and you've got a passion for it, 
I think that it works. There are there's always some people there are always some people in the class that are really interested in that. And they make the connections with their own languages, um, and I think it is a tool. It's another tool to look at. Um, similarly, you know, when you're looking at comparisons, you know, when I can show a word and I can say, well, you know, it's very similar to a word in French, but the meaning isn't the same, then that works well as well. Um, and I think it, in terms of talking about um, the history of the word and whether we use it now or we used to use this word, but we don't use it anymore, you know, that can, that can generate discussion and an interest. So, yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends. Okay, great. And last question, somebody has asked how you encourage students to read a text without translating every single word as they read. I just look at them and say, oh my God, that must be so long to do. And, you know, it's going to take you, for, you know, so long. Can you guess some of the words? And, you know, I, I think if I were to try and learn, you know, if I were to try and read something in German, I would want to do that. And I think they have to be aware that there are, you know, we have to show them tools of, can you guess this word? You know, look at this and, you know, realize that it's just not sustainable to do, to look up every single word and to really try to read a paragraph and say, okay, what's this about? Tell me what this is about. Read the sentence. What's it about? And to just try to put it in simple words. But again, we come back then to the idea of, you know, the, it's too simple and I want to put it into academic words. So, you know, it's not easy for that. Okay. Are there any others? Can I just move to the very, very last slide, sure. um, Sophie? So we have the references. And the very last slide, this is really there as an acknowledgement because it is actually International Women's Day. And I did just want to acknowledge that. And this was, I, I, was, at, I was in Canberra this week and saw this at the National Portrait uh, Gallery. And I just think this has a lot to do with words and a lot to do with the messages and the stories that we tell, because we're looking at the story. So I looked it, I, I, I looked it up a little bit. She, Marcia Langton is a professor of Australian and Indigenous Studies. She, was interested in Buddhism. There is, you know, so there's obviously the, the pose there. There's also references to Hindu gods, but it's all about power and energies and strength and the idea of conveying that to so many people. And I think this is our, you know, our job as teachers and our job, you know, our job to create learners that are strong, they're energized and they are resilient because they, you know, it's a long process. So I just wanted to finish with that and, you know, to thank people for uh, joining me this afternoon. Great. Thank you. Um, so a few people have been asking throughout the presentation if they'll be able to access the slides after this webinar. Um, yes, you will. You'll be sent the link in a follow-up email um, and also the link to the recording of the webinar. Um, so you'll be able to access the um, quite lengthy reference list as well. Thanks for providing that for us, Vanessa. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. So there are uh, so many thank yous and um, this is very useful, fabulous, very interesting. Um, lots of messages coming through for you, Vanessa. So I guess I'd just like to echo those sentiments from our audience. Um, I think we got a, a really nice balance of the the theory and some very practical applications of that in your presentation and also just so many great examples of things that we can we can do with our students to make sure that we are keeping vocabulary top of mind and the teaching of vocabulary. So thank you very much for coming along and sharing your expertise with us. Well, thank you very much. And really feel free for anybody to contact me by email at Macquarie and, you know, we can easily exchange ideas and things. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Someone's just said, that was awesome. I learned so much. So very nice. Oh, comment. great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Bye-bye.